Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to a very particular, a very special poem for a number of reasons, a Pominock picture. Now, uh, you will uh, remember that we started with Pominock, starting from Pominock, and now in some ways we end with Pominock, although obviously there are a number of poems still left in Leaves of Grass. What makes this poem so interesting, it's the last poem in Leaves of Grass that stands outside of any cluster. It will, of course, follow at the conclusion of the cluster of heavenly death and will precede the cluster of starry night. However, it's the last poem that stands on its own. It is a, another one of those brilliant, quiet scenes that we will see in Leaves of Grass. There will be a number of poems that will be, uh, that will, uh, remind, be reminded of here in, in this poem uh, as, we, as we play with it. Now, our assumptions that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Talks with Waldar Playlist, Everything from inscriptions we mentioned, starting from Pominock, up to and including the poem that we just finished, Mother uh, Equal Brood. Now, our Nortons will tell us briefly um, some information here that's of importance. From Lisa Grass 1856 through Lisa Grass 1876, these seven lines constituted Canto 8 of Salute Amand, a poem that we've already worked with, together with an opening line now dropped. Then, with a sure aesthetic instinct, the poet transferred them almost without revision to his 1881 edition as a single poem. In his 1902 Varium readings, Oscar Lull Triggs had noted the dropping of the lines without recognizing their happy reappearance. From the beginning, Whitman was able to transmit, without discussion, the meaning of such quiet scenes which have been compared with genre painting. That, what do we say? Great poets show, don't tell, right? Such scenes are displayed with virtuosity, obviously, of drum taps. Now, moss bunkers, the, the fish that will be referenced here, also as moss bunkers, uh, is the Mahidnan uh, uh, fish used for bait or converted into oil and fertilizer. You can Google image it to see what we're talking about. And then finally, in line three, it's rounding course. Having joined the ends of the two sign nets offshore, the boats return to the shore with the free ends in opposite directions around a semicircle, trapping the fish in the looped nets. Let's just enjoy the picture called a Pominock picture. By the way, Pominock used 17 times in Leaves of Grass. Um, and you'll remember that picture was referenced in Spontaneous Me, the real poem, what we call poems being merely pictures, you'll remember. Two boats with nets lying off the sea beach quite still. Ten fishermen waiting. They discover a thick school of moss bonkers. They drop the joint seam uh, ends in the water. The, bo the boats separate and row off, each on its rounding course to the beach, enclosing the moss bonkers. The net is drawn in by a windlass by those who stop ashore. Some of the fishermen lounge in their boats. Others stand ankle deep in the water, poised on strong legs. The boats partly drawn up, the water slapping against them, strewed on the sand in heaps and windrows, well out from the water, the green-backed, spotted moss bonkers. Now, again, as we've said, great poets love to show and not just tell. I think there is something going on here at 2A, and we'll get to it in a moment. Notice his use of numbers. We go from 2 to 10. Do you see it? Two boats. We've seen, obviously, this idea in a number, patrolling Barnegat and others, where boats are so significant. Two boats with nets fly, lying off the sea beach, quite still. I have said to you guys that I think Whitman, one of the great things about him as poet is that he knows how to use the word still. I think that T.S. Eliot learned how to use the word still from Whitman in his uh, Four Quartets. Notice we've got ten fishermen who are waiting. Notice we begin with kind of stillness and then we move to action in this brilliant little picture. They discover a thick school of moss bonkers. The only time this phrase gets used in all these grass is the three times here. Notice that Whitman just kind of assumes that everyone's going to know about these little fish, these little moss bonkers. They're often used as bait. They drop the joint sign ends in the water. Notice now we're beginning to work in unity coming together. The boats now will separate and row off because they're going to create this opportunity for the netting. Each on its rounding course to the beach enclosing the moss bonkers. So notice we've got a cyclical kind of movement happening. The net is drawn in by a windlass. You'll remember this from our old fuel lodge used twice by those who stop ashore. So in other words, we've got coordination of events here. Some have seen this as almost like the coordination that's uh, so significant in the study of drum taps. 
Some of the fishermen lounge in their boats. In other words, you have some who are working, some who are lounging. Others stand ankle deep in the water, poised on strong legs. Again, the emphasis of strength here. The boats partly drawn up, the water slapping against them. This, uh, this solicitation of all of the different senses here. Notice now here what you can hear. Strewed on the sand in heaps and windrows, well out from the water, the green-backed, spotted moss bonkers. Now, what are we going to do with a poem like this? I think that what's going on here is that this is, um, you know, the suggestion that great tasks require a certain kind of unity or harmony for success. In other words, we've got these ten fishermen, they all have to kind of work in consort. Some out on the boat and on the water, some at the edge of the water, and some, in fact, just lounging and watching. At 2B, notice again the power of showing through all of the different senses, and of course the word choice as well. Whitman will just assume that we as readers know what Mossbachers are, right? At 3A, I love the descriptions, that game that he plays. Go back to Ox Tamer, for example, and the way he will describe. Now, Whitman's audience would have immediately made a connection with the Gospel account in John 21, 6, when Christ tells those fishermen to cast your nut on the other side. And so immediately there's a certain kind of tradition here of catching fish with nets that will be significantly biblical that Whitman's audience would immediately go, would know. Finally, at 3B, how can we own a poem like this? Well, what is your favorite word picture to show the power and the beauty of harmony. Do you have one that comes to mind? For example, driving out here in the West, often you will see that we have large crews helping to rework the roads. Notice all of the different moving, moving parts that will create the harmony of the road itself. I think Whitman would enjoy us making connections like that. Thank you.